welcome back to part three of our complete guide to sim racing video series. So far, we've taken a look at the key fundamentals that you need to understand as you start your sim racing journey. We've taken a deeper dive into the world of sim racing pedals already. So be sure to check out those videos if you haven't already. They'll give you a good fundamental understanding and make this video make a lot more sense as well. So today we're going to be moving on into the world of wheels and wheelbases. We'll have a look at the different types of wheelbases that are available and their various different pros and cons. And as before, the aim of this video isn't to try and push you towards any particular brand or product, but rather to arm you with all the knowledge that you're going to need to do your own product research and come up with the best solutions to meet your needs and budgets with complete confidence. So let's get started. Now the first important point to cover is that contrary to what may seem logical, the wheel isn't actually the most important factor in driving quickly and consistently. That might sound a little bit counterintuitive as the wheel is what provides a majority of feedback to the driver. And sure, a good quality wheel will definitely add extra detail and help you to feel what's going on with the car. There's no question about that. Definitely helps you to feel what's going on with the car a little bit more precisely. But some of the fastest drivers around in the sim racing scene are winning using entry-level force feedback wheels such as the Logitech G29, even the G27, or even the older G25. So you need to get out of your head straight away that you need to spend a fortune on a wheel if you're gonna be competitive. That simply is not the case, and that's been proven time and time again. As I explained in part one and part two of the series already, pedals and a solid flex-free mounting solution for your hardware will have a much larger impact on your speed and consistency than an expensive wheel will have. So why is it that that's the case? It mostly comes down to muscle memory. To put it simply, your brain is very good at adapting to the inputs that it's presented with. So as long as they're consistent, for example, as long as the feeling that you're getting through the wheel is consistent every single time you approach the limit of grip, your brain will recognize this as a cue and begin to react instinctively, regardless of what it actually feels like. Unlike with upgrading to more expensive pedals, which will often give you a larger range of control as an input device, and despite the variances in input resolution, which we'll discuss a little bit later as well, as far as being an input device is concerned, a wheel is a wheel to a large extent in terms of the way it actually interprets your physical inputs and feeds them back into the game or the sim. As long as you can feel the things that you need to feel to control the car adequately, a more expensive wheel is unlikely to actually have a huge impact on your overall speed and consistency. Now that is certainly not to say that there's no point in buying a more expensive wheel or wheelbase it absolutely will make a huge impact on the overall level of immersion and realism that you experience. All I'm saying is that you don't need to spend a fortune to be fast and consistent. If you have a limited budget, you're generally gonna be better off prioritizing pedals and a solid mounting solution over a more expensive wheel and wheelbase. Now I have a few videos comparing my own driving performance using different combinations of equipment, which I'll link in the description below for you as well. Now I'm not the fastest driver around, but I am pretty consistent when it comes to using my own gear and chopping and changing between gear definitely gave me a new insight into exactly how much of a difference various different parts of equipment make in a setup. So definitely check those links out in the description. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at the various different design factors which will influence how different types of wheelbases will feel. Now I'm not going to go through every single brand and model available as things can change over time and I haven't personally tested every single wheel in existence. However, I have linked to some really valuable resources in the description for you guys to check out for more specific information relating to various different brands and models. In terms of hardware, there are three main factors which combine along with the software to influence how a wheelbase will feel and perform in terms of both the fidelity and the overall torque delivery or power delivery that you feel through your hands. Those are the type of drive, whether it be a gear, a belt or a direct drive wheel. And we'll talk about the different types in more detail a little later on as well the type of motor that's being used, we'll look at that as well, and of course the strength of the motor. So let's start off by talking about cog or gear-driven wheelbases first. Now the approach taken to this system varies slightly between different manufacturers and even models within their ranges, but generally speaking these use a series of gears to increase the strength of the feedback that you feel in lieu of a motor with more physical torque. Now this works much like the gearing inside a car. The wheel turns slower but with more torque relative to the speed of the motor itself. So you can imagine it's kind of like you put your car in first gear it has a lot more torque to get moving more quickly but the wheels don't turn as fast it's exactly the same sort of uh, basic concept with this as well now this does work quite well and it certainly keeps the production costs down hence why it's most often found in the more entry-level hardware however this approach does have its limitations which manifests in a few different ways 
Firstly, they tend to be a little bit more noisy than the direct drive or belt driven counterparts simply due to the unavoidable sound generated by the gears, you know, physically interfacing with each other. This can be a little distracting when driving as well as annoying to others, not only in the house that might be trying to sleep while you're sim racing or something like that, but also if you're racing and you have a habit of leaving your mic open when you're in Discord chat and places like that, then you can be a little bit distracting and annoying to other drivers as well. So just be aware of the extra noise that you will experience with a gear driven wheel. Now, while manufacturers generally do do a pretty good job of minimizing this by using things like helical gears instead of straight cuts, it's generally noticeable in strong oscillation type feedback events like aggressively driving over curves or ripple strips and it's translated as a sort of knocking type feeling. The best way that I can describe this is it's like putting a golf ball or a marble inside a small plastic cup and rattling it from side to side. Now that's Sort of an exaggeration in reality, and it doesn't really feel as bad as you might be imagining based off that description. But when compared to a belt driven or direct drive wheel, it's definitely something that's a little bit noticeable. It's just kind of like a knocking feeling or a slight sort of slack in the response, I guess is the best way to describe it. Now, as I alluded to before, because gearing is used to increase the torque delivery, these wheels do also have limitations in how quickly they can rotate on their own. And this isn't something that most people are likely to notice during normal type of driving or tracks or street driving, but it's certainly something that drifters in particular might want to consider. Now, you might also be thinking that due to all the moving parts, cog and gear driven wheels would be more susceptible to wear and tear or complete failure over time. But by most accounts, they actually tend to be some of the most highly rated bases on the market in terms of their reliability. And in fact, my old Logitech G27 lasted me a good 10 years of pretty frequent usage without a single issue. And I actually ended up giving that away to somebody else who's continued to use it without any problems that I'm aware of at least. So at least from my own personal experience, I don't believe it to really be a massive issue in terms of these wheels. But again, do your own research here, talk to people who have owned these for a long time, but don't go assuming that because it's cheaper, it's gonna wear out more quickly because that doesn't appear to be the case. It's also worth noting that most cog wheels are gonna be limited to around about 900 degrees of rotation as well. And this isn't gonna be an issue for most people, but again, just something to be aware of, particularly if you're doing drifting or things like maybe truck simulators, for example, that require a lot of rotation. Now, one aspect that we haven't really touched on yet is the real world implications of torque delivery or force feedback strength. Most real life road cars, even ones without power steering, once they're actually rolling, don't exceed around about seven to 12 Newton meters of torque through the steering under normal sorts of driving conditions, or in other words, when you're not crashing. Obviously, it can far and away exceed that if you were to crash into a wall and the steering suddenly jerked or something like that. And that's why you see racing drivers let go of the wheel when they're out of control. But by comparison, the gear type force feedback steering wheels currently on the market at least offer generally between about two and three Newton meters of peak torque. So yeah, even at full strength, they're not gonna be able to reproduce the same levels of forces that you'd experience beating around the track in a real car. However, I do feel that peak torque figures are often a little bit misunderstood. Remember that we're talking about the maximum amount of force here. In reality, most of the time steering a car around a track in real life, you're not gonna have anywhere near those sorts of forces fighting against you, even through static loads in corners. Now, I may not exactly be the Hulk, I don't exactly have the thickest arms in the world, but I never found my G27 to be too weak, so to speak, when it came to the static load type forces that it was generating when I was cornering. So again, just something to be aware of, unless you're built like a brick shit house, you're probably not gonna have a problem with feeling like it's too weak. So in summary, regarding gear and cog driven wheelbases, these are proven to provide great value for money and they give you all the necessary input to be competitive at least. However, they don't come close to the level of immersion and realism that you get with more expensive belt driven and direct drive wheelbases. So next, let's take a look at belt driven wheels. These are the next step up when it comes to the fidelity and torque they deliver at additional cost, of course. Now, belt driven wheels operate in a similar manner to gear driven wheels in that they use a lower torque motor by comparison to a direct drive wheel with some sort of a gearbox to increase the torque delivery at the wheel itself. But rather than using physical gears that interface directly with each other, they either use a tooth or a ribbed belt and gears to get the job done. So at least with the wheelbases that I've personally tried, this greatly reduces that sort of ball in a cup type shutter that I described earlier in relation to force feedback delivery and gives a much more refined and lifelike feeling overall. However, it does introduce what can best be described as a dampening effect, which is caused by the elasticity in the belt itself. 
In many ways, this can actually be a good thing as it smooths out some of the robotic feeling that can otherwise be present. But all other things being perfect, it definitely does reduce the overall fidelity in what you feel through the wheel compared to a direct drive wheel. So for example, road textures feel less defined and a little less lifelike. Sharp changes in direction and understeer, those sorts of feelings can feel a little bit smoother than they perhaps should. Belt driven wheels range from a torque delivery of around three to four Newton meters for the Thrustmaster T300 RS to roughly eight Newton meters for the Fnatic Club Sport wheelbase 2.5. So there's quite a range of strength available within this category with plenty of different options available depending on which ecosystem you wanna go for or your needs and budget. But we'll talk about ecosystem in more detail a little later on in the video as well. Now, before we move on to the technology behind direct drive wheelbases, I wanna take a moment to talk about the importance of software software and firmware when it comes to what you feel through the wheel. People very often get caught up in the numbers, particularly when it comes to direct drive. It's very easy to become focused on the peak torque because it's a finite number that is very easily marketable and easy to compare across different makes and models. But just because one wheel has a more powerful motor than another doesn't automatically mean that it's gonna feel better or offer more fidelity. The motor has one simple job and that is just to do what it's told. It's the responsibility of the firmware and drivers and software to translate the feedback information coming from the SIM title itself into what you ultimately feel through the wheel. Now this is done through an array of complex filtering and signal interpolation. And the quality of the software and firmware engineering is just as important, if not more important than the quality and engineering of the hardware. Now I won't go into all the nitty gritty detail now as it's beyond the scope of this video to a large extent, but if you would like to learn more about exactly how force feedback works and what all the various different settings and adjustments actually do, I have a very detailed video, which I'll link above my head for you right now where you can check that out. And I would definitely recommend doing that. It definitely will offer some insight and help you to get the most out of whatever wheel it is that you end up buying. Now, when it comes to direct drive wheels, the motor is directly connected to the wheel that you're holding, meaning that you're literally feeling absolutely everything that the motor does, including the characteristics of the motor's rotation itself. So you can imagine regardless of the strength of the feedback, if the motor is behaving badly or has an inherently notchy or grainy feel, then the feedback is also going to feel bad. And this largely boils down to how well the software and firmware are controlling the motor itself. A great example of this can be seen in my Fnatic DD2 review series, which I've linked above my head for you right now. I was initially quite disappointed with the overall feel provided as I'd expected a lot more of a refined experience out of the DD2. But after updating to the latest firmware and software, this completely transformed it to the point where it actually felt like a completely different wheelbase. So the point here is don't underestimate the importance of well-refined software as well as well-adjusted settings. Resolution and interface data rate are also important factors as they'll also influence how quickly the wheel can react to changes in the game for a smooth output, as well as relaying information or positional feedback from what you're actually doing into the game for smooth and fast input with no input lag. Now in terms of hardware, besides the overall motor strength, direct drive wheelbases come in a few different flavors depending on how much you're prepared to spend. Most manufacturers list the type of motor that they use and each motor type has its own characteristics which influence how they feel. So it's quite important to understand them at a basic level. The more entry level direct drive wheelbases will typically use a stepper motor or more accurately a hybrid servo stepper motor. The difference being that a hybrid servo stepper motor features a higher pole count than you'd normally find in a conventional stepper motor and also includes a position sensor to operate in a closed loop so the software always knows the current position of the wheel. Stepper motors by definition operate in an open loop and don't have any form of positional feedback. Now due to their higher pole count, hybrid servo stepper motors produce a high amount of torque at low speeds and are relatively cheap to manufacture, which makes them quite compelling for cheaper wheelbases. However, at higher speeds, they can lose up to 80% of their torque. Now by comparison, a servo motor as used in the more expensive direct drive wheelbases, those are able to produce high levels of torque at high speed. Now they also operate at a much higher efficiency, therefore producing less heat. Both hybrid servo stepper motors and servo motors are susceptible to what's referred to as a cogging or detent effect. Now this is where the strength of the electromagnetic field varies slightly between the teeth of the rotor and the stator depending on their relative position, creating what's known as torque ripples or slight variations in the torque as the motor rotates. This effect along with phase imbalancing produces the underlying notchy characteristics that are present in some direct drive wheelbases that you guys might have tried. And you might remember this is something that I mentioned as noticing in my review of the SimMagic M10. Now in my experience, this is something that you don't 
tend to notice so much after driving for a while. And if you've never used a high-end servo motor wheelbase before, you might not even really notice it at all. But little characteristics such as this do tend to take away from the overall feeling of realism and immersion. After all, the holy grail is for your wheel to feel as much like the wheel in a real car as possible. More expensive motors with complex feedback systems and higher precision internals are able to minimize this effect in varying degrees to the point where it's quite literally unnoticeable in my Simicube 2 Ultimate, for example. So once again here, we're getting what we pay for. So direct drive has become a little bit of a buzzword or a buzz term recently. And what I want you guys to understand is that just because a wheel is direct drive doesn't automatically mean that it's going to be leagues ahead of other wheels that are available. To give you an example from my own personal experience again, somewhat surprisingly to me at least, I actually found it to be quite a difficult choice between the direct drive Simmagic M10 that I reviewed and the similarly priced belt driven Fnatic Club Sport wheelbase 2.5. The Simmagic M10 is absolutely undoubtedly stronger and offers more fidelity or detail in the force feedback in the majority of scenarios, but the Club Sport gives an overall more well-refined and lifelike feeling through the wheel. And this combined with Fnatic's more advanced or more, I guess, mature ecosystem really made it quite a tough decision for me to choose between the two. But that's just my own personal opinion, and I'm sure that a lot of other people who have tried both as well will disagree with me there. As I mentioned with my Fnatic DD2 experience, the older firmware and drivers definitely didn't feel anywhere near as good as the newer ones. And I'm hopeful that SimMagic will also be able to refine their product over time in a similar fashion. Now, the other major differentiating factor between different direct drive wheelbases is, of course, their motor strength. Direct drive wheels on the market currently vary in strength from around about 10 newton meters for the SimMagic M10 all the way up to 32 newton meters for the SimiCube 2 Ultimate. And I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that are using even stronger motors on the open sim wheel platform as well. As I mentioned before, keep in mind that the forces that you feel through the wheel of a real car usually fall somewhere around the sort of seven to 12 newton meters mark at peak. Now, from what I've seen, the majority of high-end direct drive wheelbase users seem to settle for a setting somewhere around the sort of 12 to 15 newton meter mark based on the settings that I've seen shared in various different forum posts and online. Personally, I run my Simicube 2 Ultimate at about 11 newton meters of peak torque. However, the additional torque headroom does reduce the likelihood of clipping as well as increase the potential for extra fidelity under low torque scenarios. So there is definitely other advantages to higher end motors, but the peak numbers themselves don't necessarily reflect how one wheelbase will compare to another in terms of driving feel. Now there is one other type of motor called an outrunner motor, which at the time of making this video is used exclusively by Fnatic in their DD1 and DD2 wheelbases. These motors spin their outer shell around the inner windings, and in my opinion, these aren't inherently better or worse by design than a hybrid servo stepper motor or a servo motor. Again, it boils down to the quality of the components used, the resolution and sensitivity, as well as the software and firmware being used to control it. Now, there is some noticeable torque ripple effect present in my DD2 when compared with my Simicube 2 Ultimate, which in fairness does cost double the amount but it's a very small amount and honestly, I tend to forget about it after a couple of laps of driving anyway, unless I specifically pay attention to it, of course. But if I sit down in my simulator and close my eyes, the Simicube 2 Ultimate is the only wheelbase that I've personally used that could genuinely fool me into thinking that I'm sitting in a real car. It really is just that good. Now, I haven't personally tested a Simicube 2 Sport or a Pro yet, so I can't tell you how those compare to the Ultimate, but I do hope to be doing that very soon. I also haven't personally tested other brands offering such as the Acuforce Pro or the Sim Steering 2, but should the opportunity arise, I'll definitely let you know how those compare in my experience as well. So that brings us to our final topic, which is ecosystems. Most entry-level wheels will have a fixed wheel, which you can't change without aftermarket or DIY modification. Now, it's important to note that there is definitely no shortage of such mods available. These types of wheels often also come bundled with pedals, and in some cases, a shifter as well, which makes it nice and easy to plug and play with a single USB connection as well. Now, this will typically make software configuration and in-game detection pretty simple as well. And in my experience, you can generally go from unboxing to driving in around about 10 to 15 minutes, which is really great for a lot of people. Now, as you move up, interchangeable wheels become a feature as well, starting with the belt-driven offerings from Thrustmaster and Fnatic and continued across all brands within the direct drive space. This means that you can change the different styles or diameters depending on the type of car that you're driving, as well as your own personal preference. 
Ease of access to buttons and encoders for making adjustments to things like fuel trim, brake bias or differential without having to take your eyes off the road can shave seconds off your lap times and definitely have done for me. So definitely not something that should be overlooked either. One important distinction to make is that within the Fnatic, Thrustmaster, SimMagic and AccuForce ecosystems, assuming you wish to retain full button functionality without using a separate connection to your PC, the only wheels available without the use of an adapter of some sort are manufactured by the brands themselves. Whereas with SimiCube 2 or SimiCube 1 with an add-on Bluetooth module, you have access to a growing range of wireless wheels which connect directly to the wheelbase, as well as of course being able to mount any wide wheel that you'd want to use with a physical connection via USB to your PC directly as well. So it's worth noting, however, that these wireless wheels don't offer anywhere near the same level of functionality as is offered within the Fnatic ecosystem. You can't make adjustments to your wheel, feedback and pedal settings on the fly or display telemetry via the SimiCube wireless system like you can with Fnatic's ecosystem. And this is one area where I feel Fnatic do definitely still have an advantage over the competition in the direct drive space at present. And it'll certainly be interesting to see what Thrustmaster and Logitech can bring to the table should they ever enter the direct drive space. The ability to change settings on the fly might sound trivial, but it does make a huge practical difference as it allows you to set up different profiles for different sims and cars and easily switch between them without the need to spend lots of time opening different software or alt tabbing or you know, having to bring up overlays and things like that. And it also avoids having to recalibrate every time you change cars as well. As I said in my pedals video, I'm not suggesting that you should pick one ecosystem and stick to it for the rest of your sim racing career, but I do suggest that you carefully consider which ecosystem appeals to you and how it influences your purchasing decisions to keep things as simple as is practical. Less time stuffing around is more time driving and that is always a good thing. So that just about wraps it up for wheels and wheelbases. If there's anything else that you'd like to know or anything that you think I've missed or any mistakes that you think I've made, please do let me know in the comments or feel free to jump into our friendly Discord community as well where we now have over 1,400 members. It's jumped up by about 200 members just in the last couple of days, which is awesome. And we're all happy to help you out and offer our expertise based off our own personal experiences there as well. So link is in the description for that. Now in the next video, we'll be taking a closer look at how to choose an appropriate monitor as well as triple screens and VR. And then we'll be moving on to building a PC that's appropriate for your needs. Then finally, I'll go into my tips for essential software and setup for sim racing. So if you're not already subscribed, now is a great time to do so. While you're down there as well, make sure you click on the notification bell so you don't miss future videos when they're released. And finally, if you're enjoying the content, looking at buying some sim racing gear and would like to help me out, I do have some affiliate links in the description below as well, which don't cost you anything extra, but send a small commission my way, which is what keeps this channel running. So I do massively appreciate your support there. So with all of that said, enjoy the experience of choosing a wheel. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.